All right, for this lecture, we're going to talk about hemodynamics. Uh, particularly, we're going to look at how blood flow is regulated throughout the body. Uh, one question that I want you guys to keep in your mind throughout the whole day is this scenario. Uh, a couple years ago, I did a study where I had people do one-legged cycling. Uh, and the, the form of one-legged cycling was a little funny. They're sitting in this chair. And the, they're, they're in this boot, which is connected to a bike pedal. So they're, they're biking with one leg, okay? So one-legged cycling versus two-legged cycling, right? And we measured blood pressure in the femoral artery uh, directly as they were doing it. Now, here, look at the difference in, in the blood pressure, right? So if I had them do 20 watts on on a bike with two legs, the pressure would be right about here. If I had them do 20 watts with one leg, pressure was way higher. Look at 30. So 30 is a lot more dramatic. So 30 watts, here's pressure with two legs exercising. 30 watts with one leg, the pressure is ridiculously higher. Why? Why would blood pressure be so much higher if you're using just one limb? Hopefully by the end of today, you'll connect all the dots and figure out why that would be. So by way of outline, we're going to talk about how you distribute cardiac output and how vascular resistance is used to distribute that cardiac output. Then we'll, we'll talk about dilation of arteries and how oxygen is diffused into capillaries. When you exercise, blood flow goes up. It should be no, no surprise here, right? So this was a study I did a couple years ago where we measured blood flow in an untrained population and a, an endurance trained population. We had them do the one-legged cycling again. And for a given work rate, didn't matter if they were trained or untrained, blood flow was roughly the same. But what I want you to notice is that blood flow at rest was probably about 500 milliliters in these people, milliliters per minute. Some of them maybe even down to 200 milliliters. At max exercise, these people were hitting 5,000 milliliters per minute. So we're getting a tenfold increase in blood flow. Cardiac output at rest on average is about 5 liters per minute. During exercise, even in like your most trained people at BYU, they might hit 30 liters per minute. So that's definitely not a tenfold increase in cardiac output. Um, let's just, for simplicity, let's say at exercise, most people actually are going to be about 25 liters per minute. So that's a five-fold increase, not tenfold. Blood flow to the leg is going up 10 times, but how much blood is coming out of the heart is only going up five times. How on earth are you increasing blood flow to the leg 10 times if the heart is only pumping five times as much blood? It comes down to distribution of blood. Uh, if you had to decide where you're going to distribute the blood, what would you say? What would you think is the most important? Um, cardiac output is finite. You only have so much of it. Uh, even in your like your normal college students, probably right around 25 liters per minute. Um, that is not enough to give everything in your body all the blood flow it could want. If you're doing maximum exercise, um, and you dilated everything, you would need a cardiac output of like 100 liters per minute to satisfy all of those organs. So with 30 liters per minute only available, you have to prioritize, you have to budget. You can't give the digestive system all the blood it wants and the skeletal muscle all the blood it wants. Uh, you have to have a compromise. And when you exercise, usually what happens is that you you prioritize the skeletal muscle at, during exercise. About 80% of the blood coming out of your heart during exercise is going to go to your skeletal muscle. Um, and the things that come in last are going to be the viscera, or sometimes called your splanchnic region. This is like your guts, uh, your digestive system, your kidneys. Blood flow to those are going to decrease during exercise. Now, how do you do that? How do you decrease blood flow in one area and increase it in the other? 
Um, let's look at this another way. So at rest, cardiac output, five liters per minute. Your guts are getting about 20% of that. Your heart gets about four or 5%. Now look at skeletal muscle, 15 to 20%. Right now when you exercise, sound effects, the cardiac output goes up to about 25 liters per minute. So we have a much greater cardiac output. Now the viscera are only getting about 3% of that, whereas the skeletal muscle get about 80%. So much a much greater percentage of the cardiac output is distributed over to the, the skeletal muscle during exercise. But one of the things that limits exercise capacity is actually your ability to, to give even more blood there, especially for elite endurance trained individuals. If you could take that cardiac output from 25 liters per minute to 30 liters per minute, that would mean you'd have a bigger circle here, more blood and oxygen going to the skeletal muscle, which means greater running speed uh, during your 5K or whatever you're looking at uh, for aerobic exercise. All right, so how do, you, how do you distribute this cardiac output? I like to refer to this as the cardiac output budget. Just generally, the higher the intensity of the exercise, the greater proportion of blood flow going to skeletal muscle. Um, so look at this, these numbers are outrageous. So rest would be zero. So this the, the axis here is blood flow as a percent of rest. Uh, so we got at rest, let's say, the I already mentioned like 200 to 500 milliliters per minute through the femoral artery at rest. When you exercise, that can go up 1,600 times. Uh, one, or one, it's 1,600 percent of that. That's 16 fold increase, right? We have a huge increase in muscle blood flow, but blood flow to the the splanchnic area. Splanchnic is just a fancy word for like the guts and the kidneys. That's going to decrease. So you're taking blood away from non-essential areas at the time to areas that need it for the motion, right? You budget, and then during rest, that's when you perfuse blood to the, the splanchnic region. But how do you do this? How do you actually regulate that? You get the concept that you take blood away from inactive areas, whether it's the splanchnic region, the kidneys, or inactive muscle, and give it over to the area of high demand, the skeletal muscle. But how does that happen? All right, so it comes down to vascular resistance. Vascular resistance is the, you can calculate it, as the change, uh, it's not it's not on here. Uh, resistance can be equal to the change in pressure divided by flow. It's kind of an abstract thing. That's one way you can calculate it. Um, but conceptually, resistance. We saw this in a previous one. Resistance is the length of the, the vascular network, the viscosity of the blood, and most importantly, the radius of the vascular network. Um, and this is what you're going to change, this radius. Radius is how we're taking blood flow away from the, the kidneys and the gut and allocating it towards the skeletal muscle. We decrease the radius of the arteries in the gut and increase the radius of the arteries in the skeletal muscle, the active skeletal muscle. Um, so how does this happen? Just to, to, pr to prove a point that this is, your blood flow is mostly being regulated by changes in, in radius, let's look at what happens to, to the Poisson's equation, right? Poisson's equation is flow is equal to the change in pressure times pi radius to the fourth over eight NL. Um, what happens to the change in pressure? These these things not so important when we're thinking about exercise blood flow. They're not going to change all that much. Pressure and radius do. So let's look at what happens to pressure. Maybe our increase in blood flow is because of a change in pressure. Blood, blood pressure, uh, I guess I just don't have it on here. Uh, blood pressure increases maybe from a mean arterial pressure of 93 millimeters mercury up to maybe 140 as a high, right, during exercise. You don't even double it. You're not even gonna double mean arterial pressure. So 
if pressure was the only thing to change, where is this thing? If pressure is the only thing to change, we would go from here to here, right? Just a small, that's all the increase that pressure can account for. The rest of it is going to be that increase in pressure simultaneously with an increase in radius. Radius changes a lot, and because it's to the fourth power, even a little change in radius has a huge impact on blood flow. <clears throat> so here's another way to look at blood flow. Blood flow is the change in pressure over resistance. If you have a high resistance, you're gonna have low flow. If you have a high pressure difference, you'll get higher blood flow. Just kind of work on that equation as you study, try and, and manipulate it and get familiar with it. Now resistance, what causes resistance to be low is a high radius. If you dilate everything, you're going to have a very low resistance. So when you exercise, you dilate the arteries in the skeletal muscle and cause very low resistance in the skeletal muscle, but you constrict the radius or the arteries in the, in the gut. And so you'll have very high resistance and low flow in the gut. So just changing resistance, low resistance in the skeletal muscle, high resistance in the gut, directs the blood flow where you need it to go. All right, so if we look at our arteries, we have a couple different types of these arteries. Uh, some of them are called conduit arteries, uh, like your, the large arteries, this would be like your aorta, or uh, like your brachial artery, femoral artery. They're called conduit arteries. And the job of these arteries is primarily to direct blood flow just everywhere. Uh, they don't change their diameter or their resistance a whole lot. They can, a little, but not a ton. Um, they, their job is just to, to conduct it. When we get down to these arterioles, uh, arterioles are smaller arteries, and they have a whole lot more of this smooth muscle in here. And the more smooth muscle you have, the more you can change the diameter. So while your, your big arteries might be able to go from this big to this big, your little arteries can go from here to here, all the way back down to tiny, right? You have a huge change in diameter there. And because these arterioles, there's, they can, there's a lot of them and they resist flow quite a bit, blood pressure decreases at the level of these resistance arteries. Um, one thing that drives me crazy uh, is the persistence of this. This comes straight out of your textbook, pre-capillary sphincters. Um, put that right up there with Bigfoot. These suckers do not exist. Um, even though your te textbook will talk about them and you'll see them, you go to med school, people will tell you they're there. They are not there. What a precapillary sphincter is in theory, uh, people have hypothesized that you have these little uh, valves that turn individual capillaries on or off uh, so that you can have capillaries with no flow or flow. It, you look in human arteries, you just can't find them. They don't exist. All the blood flow is controlled by the arterioles. If you want to increase blood flow through one of your capillaries, let's cross this out, it doesn't exist. If you want to increase blood flow through one of your capillaries, you dilate the upstream arterial. And it's not just going to increase flow through one capillary, but all of the capillaries downstream of that. It makes this vascular uh, system, vascular network, downstream of the arterial. Um, so precapillary sphincters, not true, not there. Um, most of the change in pressure and regulation of flow happens in these arterioles. And all right, so let's look at our artery here. So we have an artery and in our artery comes in layers. Uh, you have the most innermost layer, which is one of the most important. This is the endothelium. The innermost layer is single, out, single layer, wow, single layer of cells thick, and it's lined around by smooth muscle. The endothelium was originally just thought to be a barrier, 
uh, just to protect the smooth muscle. But now it's recognized that the endothelium is very responsible for telling the, the smooth muscle what to do in many situations. It's like the boss. So the endothelium will sense different hormones. It will sense changes in flow, changes in temperature, and it will release dilators like nitric oxide. The endothelium releases that, which then go over to the smooth muscle and cause the smooth muscle to relax and expand. Uh, the smooth muscle, in contrast, by its, it can also contract. Norepinephrine causes calcium to flow into the smooth muscle. And when calcium comes in, just like with uh, the skeletal muscle, the calcium will cause contraction and uh, the, the artery will get smaller. I should say, though, that the, the setup with actin, myosin, and calcium is slightly different in the smooth muscle. Uh, I'm not too concerned that you understand that for this class, but just know that it's not the standard setup with troponin and myosin, uh, myosin ATPase like you have in the skeletal muscle. All right, so we have our layers, endothelium, smooth muscle, and then this outer layer is called the adventitia, which just mostly, as far as we understand right now, mostly a barrier. Um, how is blood flow regulated? It's all these arterioles. Um, the arterial, so here's an arterial, and it's feeding this capillary, that capillary, uh, might even provide some flow down to that capillary. So if blood, if the arterial here got completely pinched off, uh, you'd get no blood flow downstream. That doesn't really happen too often unless you get like a, a heart attack, like is where you get an occlusion in an artery or arterial, and now you can't get blood flow downstream. Um, so the arterioles really regulate blood flow. In the, in the skeletal muscle, the ar arteries are set up and the capillaries are set up to be around the skeletal muscle as closely as possible. So here we have a muscle fiber, uh, a cross section of it, and then you can see capillary, capillary, capillary. Here's much capillaries as well. The more capillaries that a muscle is in contact with, the easier it is to get oxygen into the muscle. Now, let's look at this video. Uh, this is a really a quite fantastic video. Here's what they're doing. Um, in the video, they, they have some muscle. I can't remember what the animal was. Uh, it might have been a hamster or a rat. Uh, but they expose the muscle, put it under a microscope so that they can see the red blood cells flow through. What you got right here is an arterial. Oh, man, I'm starting the video. Dang. Okay, you had an, we have, they start off where they dilate the artery. Uh, they put in adenosine, which causes the artery to dilate, and then they'll constrict it with phenylephrine or epinephrine mimetic. And you can just see what happens to flow through the big arteries and all the little capillaries downstream. It's really quite amazing. All right, so here's a credit to Dr. whatever his name is. So they've contracted the arteries, shrunk them as small as possible with norepinephrine. And now they've applied adenosine. Adenosine is going to cause, oh, come on, Jason. See how I yell at myself? So adenosine is going to cause the, these arteries to get better. You, can you see how there's a couple of red blood cells flowing? Now as this gets bigger, the capillaries are now getting full of red blood cells. Look how many red blood cells are all over there. Um, the this feed artery gets much much bigger and now you got red blood cells going all throughout that muscle whereas at the beginning remember when it was constricted uh, you have very small artery and there's really not a lot of flux going on through that muscle you can see it, one or two red blood cells coming through but then you dilate it and now you're getting blood flow all throughout this muscle change in radius has such a big influence on how much blood flows through there. As you dilate the radius, it increases the flow. Part of the reason that flow increases is because as you dilate the increase the radius, resistance drops and allows flow to go. Also, blood pressure would drop because of that. So dilation of these arterioles in the skeletal muscle is a major factor in and blood flow during exercise. All right, so 
now the question comes up, how would you, what mechanism would you use to preferentially distribute blood from the, from one area to another? How would you get blood flow to increase in the muscle while decreasing in the gut? Well, the, the way this happens is actually quite ingenious. It's called sympatholysis. Um, I want you to remember back when we talked about insulin, right? Remember insulin uh, is a hormone that causes glucose uptake uh, in all the muscle throughout the body. It doesn't, uh, any muscle that hooks up with a, an insulin receptor is gonna cause glucose uptake as long as you don't have type two diabetes. Um, when we exercise, we reduce insulin secretion. We decrease uh, glucose uptake everywhere because we only have a little bit of glucose and we want it to go preferentially to the active muscle. So we reduce insulin secretion during exercise and then we have a different mechanism, one specific to the exercising muscle, that takes the glucose up. Remember, contractions cause uh, GLUT4 to transport glucose into the exercising muscle, all independent of insulin. This idea is it's local regulation. You get the glucose where you need it, the exercising muscle, and not other places. You have a very similar setup conceptually going on with blood flow and sympatholysis. When you exercise, you have a sympathetic signal that causes sympathetic nerves to release norepinephrine on pretty much all of the arteries throughout your body. There might be an exception here or there, but the vast majority of these arteries are going to get exposed to norepinephrine. And with the exception of the heart and the skin, norepinephrine causes constriction. So when the norepinephrine is released, it causes the arteries to contract and get smaller. We're reducing blood flow everywhere. Okay, that mean, That's how we reduce blood flow in the gut. We constrict it. That's how we reduce blood flow in non-exercising muscle. We constrict the arteries. But how do we increase the blood flow to the exercising muscle? We have the signal even going on in the exercising muscle to constrict. How are we going to get it to dilate? Well, it comes down to this idea of sympatholysis and local regulation. So we have the sympathetic signal happening in the exercising muscle too, but we also have something else, a tug of war, so to speak, signaling for dilation. As you exercise, you get these exercise stimuli like heat, pH, uh, adenosine diphosphate, uh, several other things, potassium. Um, other factors can cause, stimulate the endothelium. These exercise stimuli make their way to the endothelium, and the endothelium in response releases dilators, endothelial-dependent dilators. And those dilators go in a tug of war, so to speak, um, with norepinephrine. And so let's just draw a balance here. So you have norepinephrine, and I'm just going to write NO. NO represents nitric oxide, not, not the word NO, but NO. Nitric oxide is the most common endothelial dependent dilator. It's this thing, the major one, right? So if you're going to have constriction, the, the balance needs to tip in favor of norepinephrine. If you have more norepinephrine than nitric oxide, you'll get constriction. When you exercise though, you have a lot more nitric oxide in a healthy person than norepinephrine, and that means dilation. Wow. Hopefully your guys' handwriting is better than mine. All right, so it's this battle. You still have norepinephrine being released from the sympathetic nerves in your exercising muscle, which if there was no nitric oxide around would cause constriction. But because exercise stimulates the endothelium to release nitric oxide and other endothelial dependent dilators, now the, the dilators win in the battle and cause blood flow to increase in the exercising muscle. So we decrease blood flow to the gut with sympathetic stimulation. We increase blood flow to the exercising muscle with local dilation caused by endothelium dependent dilators like nitric oxide. Now here's the thing, this works really well in young people and, and active adults, but if you are sick uh, with some kind of vascular disease, if you smoke, or if you're older, uh, 
the the balance between nitric oxide and norepinephrine tends to favor norepinephrine a little more often. And so you don't get as much dilation in the active muscle as you might normally get. Uh, that happens with disease and aging. So <clears throat> you can imagine there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out ways to increase nitric oxide and these other endothelium dependent dilators to ensure that blood flow stays adequate with aging and disease. And we'll talk about some of those things uh, at the end of this lecture. Some of the things we're actually doing in my lab for our research. All right, so here's an example of sympatholysis, right? In this study, this was one of my friends, uh, Walter Ray. He did a study a couple, well, 16 years ago now, um, where he measured femoral artery blood flow. So he measured blood flow through the femoral artery at rest and during single leg cycling exercise. At rest, this is what how much blood flowed through the leg. And then they had him come back on another day and they did they measured blood flow at rest again with a norepinephrine mimetic in there, just a drug that mimics norepinephrine. You can see that inf infusing norepinephrine caused blood flow to decrease at rest. And then when they're doing light in intensity exercise, blood flow with norepinephrine infusion also decreased it. Right, so the you can see the norepinephrine is causing vasoconstriction and reducing blood flow. But look when they get to this, this moderate intensity exercise. Now the norepinephrine, especially right here, isn't having an effect. The exercise is causing the endothelium to produce a lot of nitric oxide and other dilators that counteract the norepinephrine. So in that balance, at the low ends here, like seven watts and at rest, the, the balance favors norepinephrine instead of NO and the other nitric ox, other endothelium dependent dilators, because you're infusing a ton of norepinephrine in this study. But when they get to higher intensity exercise, now the, the endothelium is producing a lot of nitric oxide and other dilators, which outweigh the effect of the norepinephrine and you get dilation. So that's an example of sympatholysis, sympatholysis. And it's super important for getting blood flow where it needs to go. You don't have enough cardiac output to deliver blood flow to everything at once. You have to decide which organ gets the blood flow at, during exercise. And most of the times, the skeletal muscle is going to win out. So what are some consequences of endothelium-dependent dilation? Um, as I mentioned, nitric oxide is one of the main main endothelium dependent dilators. Uh, nitric oxide is released by this little endothelium in here, the single layer cells thick. Um, it causes dilation like we've discussed, but also nitric oxide is super important for the healthier arteries. It inhibits atherosclerosis and clot formation or thrombus formation. And it also promotes angiogenesis or the development of new arteries. Um, other dilators, prostaglandins, and hyperpolarizing factor have similar roles, uh, but by far nitric oxide, at least based on the research as it currently stands, nitric oxide is the most important one for controlling blood flow um, and the health of your arteries. So let's, let's look at this. So nitric oxide causes dilation. So if you have a lot of nitric oxide, you should be able to dilate. If you have a lot of nitric oxide, you should also be able to inhibit atherosclerosis. So what we do in my lab is we look at how well these arteries can dilate. We use ultrasound to look at the arteries and we see how well they dilate. And that's an index of how at risk someone is for atherosclerosis, heart attack, and all sorts of other cardiovascular diseases. The health of this endothelium is very important for, uh, for the development of disease. In fact, what we have, we have something called endothelial dysfunction. Sometimes I wish I was a good, as good at this as the guys on Khan Academy. Uh, they're good at writing on this and I'm not so good yet. Maybe someday. All right, so we have this situation called endothelial dysfunction. And that's where the endothelium, for some reason, can't get nitric oxide produced or can't get it to the smooth muscle, or also the prostaglandins can't get it, these other ways of dilating. They just don't work well enough. Um, 
And, and so what that means is you have less nitric oxide to inhibit atherosclerosis and, and hypertension and all that. Endothelial dysfunction, this tiny layer of cells that everyone ignored until 1988, whenever people started thinking about it, there's a Nobel Prize given around then for the endothelium. Um, this tiny layer of cells, when it goes bad and can't do its job properly, um, that is the first step in the development of cardiovascular disease. Years and years before you ever see atherosclerosis and heart attacks and strokes, the endothelium goes bad. And so in my lab, we study ways to improve the health of this endothelium before uh, you have overt symptoms of cardiovascular disease. We measure the health of the, the endothelium and we try to improve the health of it. One of the ways we measure the health of it is uh, with ultrasound. So we have a person sitting in a chair here and we have an ultrasound probe. The same thing that you would use to look at a baby in a, in a mother's belly, we use to look at a person's artery. And we can measure how much blood flow goes through the artery during rest and exercise and how much the artery dilates. Um, we do this thing where we, we wiggle their leg back and forth. It's just a, yeah, basically we move the leg back and forth mimicking exercise and when you mimic exercise the arteries think that they need to release nitric oxide and other dilators and so the arteries dilate and blood flow goes up and we measure blood flow with the ultrasound now in a healthy person blood flow goes up a lot in an unhealthy person it doesn't go up as much and in a person with heart failure it barely goes up at all right so we use how much blood flow goes up in response to this fake exercise uh, to decide how or to guess how healthy the endothelium is. Um, actually, what we found is that this hyperemic or increase in blood flow, this wave, if we take nitric oxide out of the equation, even in a young, healthy person, the response is down here. So much of that increase in blood flow is because of nitric oxide. Healthy Young, healthy people have more dilation capacity. Old people, sedentary people, sick people, they can't dilate as much. Um, and that shows up in terms of vascular resistance. An untrained person, uh, they, they can only decrease resistance so much. A trained person will decrease resistance more because they can dilate more and accommodate more blood flow. So in my lab, we look at different ways to increase uh, nitric oxide availability and your ability to dilate the health of the endothelium. Some things that we've done in the past, uh, in my previous lab, we used stuff called beetroot juice. Uh, you can get this at GNC. Um, the beet, the juice from beets, just your little red beets, concentrated, has a lot of nitrate. And that nitrate in your body can be converted to nitric oxide and help with the dilation. Um, it's not a given for everyone, but in different patient populations, it can be helpful. I've used a lot of, in studies in the past, we've used antioxidants to increase nitric oxide availability. Nitric oxide is a radical. It, it has an unpaired electron. And one of the things that happens with aging is that you get a lot of free radicals. Just like nitric oxide is a free radical, but you get these others that shouldn't be there. And they go and they scoop up nitric oxide, kidnap it. They bind with it really fast. Uh, unpaired electrons like to bind with other electrons really quickly. So if you have a lot of free radicals or oxidative stress around, they're going to bind to the nitric oxide and not allow it to do its job. So in the studies that I've done in the past, and several people have done these, uh, have that unpaired electron. So we'll just say that's the electron there. Um, instead of letting the free radicals bind with the nitric oxide, you put in something like vitamin C and it blocks the free radical from getting to nitric oxide and the free radical instead binds to the vitamin C, leaving nitric oxide to do its job. In old people, we've shown several times that if you give them uh, antioxidants, sometimes vitamin C, sometimes more sophisticated ones, you can improve their dilate, dilatory capacity. Um, other things that we're looking at to improve the health of the arteries, uh, heat. This one's exciting. Actually, let me start with this. Exercise. This is my little daughter. She's just riding a bike out in our front yard. Um, 
exercise training increases nitric oxide availability, increases your arteries ability to dilate uh, quite a bit. And so we're right now we're stuttering, studying, I'm also stuttering, we're studying different ways to improve different types of exercise, seeing which ones improve artery health the most. Uh, we're looking at interval training versus standard moderate intensity training. Now, one that we're actually, I'm actually really excited about is the prospect of using heat. Um, one of the ways that exercise seems to improve the health of the arteries is just by getting the arteries hot. Uh, there are other stimuli involved in the exercise, but heat is a major one of those. And so what we're doing in a study right now is taking the heat out of away from the exercise. So we just go and heat up your muscles. We use uh, we're not using a hot tub right now. We're actually using something a, a little more sophisticated, scientific, to locally heat the muscle and raise it to temperatures you would see in exercise. And our theory is that we can make the arteries almost as healthy as they would get from exercise without ever lifting a finger. Uh, this would have a really good application for people that are on bed rest, uh, people, astronauts who are in uh, microgravity, they don't exercise, they can't exercise, there's not a lot of gravity, right? And so if we could just heat their muscles, we can keep their arteries healthy or even make them healthier. So that's some of the stuff we're looking into right now. All right, so back to that question I, I issued at the beginning. Remember in this, in this study that I was doing, we had people come in on two different days and we measured pressure, our mean arterial pressure, during either two-legged cycling or one-legged cycling. And now look, let's look at 40 watts if, if we or 30 watts. When we had them do 30 watts, one-legged cycling pressure was way up. Uh, with two legs, it wasn't very high. Why is that? They're, you're doing the same amount of work. You're just spreading it across two legs now in this cycling instead of one. Why would blood pressure be so much lower in the two-legged cycling? It comes down to that idea of sympatholysis. When you're, exercise, when you're exercising, you have a sympathetic signal cause everything to constrict. And then you only get dilation in the active area. So <clears throat> what happens with two-legged cycling or one-legged cycling, you you're dilating one leg. And so you only have that much of the radius to dilate. In two-legged cycling, now you're dilating two legs, so you have a lot more dilation to keep the pressure down. Remember, mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times vascular resistance, and the resistance is equal to the viscosity times the length over the radius to the fourth. The more arteries you have, the greater that radius. You only have so many arteries in one leg. You have, if you take two legs, you have twice as many arteries, right? So you can have this R be twice as big, which decreases the resistance and decreases your arterial pressure. So small muscle mass exercise actually has the chance of increasing blood pressure to a greater extent than large muscle mass exercise. Uh, one, one interesting application to this, people that have weak hearts, heart failure, we, we've been talking a lot about heart failure, people that have weak hearts, um, they're often recommended to avoid uh, arm exercise, like shoveling snow is one of the most notorious ones they're told to avoid. When you shovel snow, you're primarily using the arms to move that snow shovel. It's arm exercise. And so you, you send out a sympathetic signal to constrict everything everywhere. Your legs, your gut, uh, everywhere is getting a signal to constrict except you get the local dilation signal in the arms. And your arms aren't very big. That's not a slam on you. It's just they're, they don't account for a whole bunch of muscle mass. Uh, and so you don't have a very big R to, to de decrease your resistance, and so pressure goes up really high. For a given in t uh, power output, you'll get a much greater increase in blood pressure with arm exercise than leg. And it's almost all due to the muscle mass. Uh, the more muscle mass you can spread the work over, the more you can dilate. All right, one more thing about directing blood flow. Uh, 
we've talked about how the blood gets to the, the general muscle, but now how do you get the, the oxygen out of the capillary into the mitochondria? And it comes down to diffusion, right? So let's follow our path of oxygen again. You started, we started with oxygen in the atmosphere. We inhaled it through the lungs, through ventilation. Then we got pulmonary diffusion to get it to bind to the red blood cells. The heart then pumped the red blood cells down to the muscle. That's where we're at now. How are we getting the oxygen from here to there? It comes down to oxygen diffusion. Now, we talked about diffusion up here. Remember fixed law of diffusion? Oh, let's see if I have it up here. Yeah, fixed law of diffusion. Fixed law of diffusion, we, we talked about it in the lungs. Um, the major factors that are going to influence how well oxygen diffuses is the area for gas exchange. That's going to be how many capillaries are in contact with the muscle. Uh, the difference in oxygen pressure, uh, so the pressure of oxygen in the, in the capillary versus the muscle, and the distance that the capillary or the oxygen has to diffuse. So let's think about how these factors are going to be impacted uh, in the muscle. Uh, so here's an example of a skeletal muscle. You can see like the, the sarcomeres, the striation, right? The capillaries just wrap around that thing. And this is a pretty good example of what happens. Capillaries are wrapping all around the skeletal muscle, keeping in contact with it as much as possible. So you have a really high surface area for diffusion. Um, and then the pressure... Uh, as you exercise, you're going to consume oxygen in those mitochondria, and that's going to drop the pressure in the mitochondria. So if this is, let's, instead of saying P1, P2, let's say this is capillary pressure, so P cap minus P mito, mitochondrial pressure. As you're exercising, you're consuming a lot more oxygen, so that P mito is going to get very small. So the difference in pressure, if this is at rest, this would be P cap, this is P mito. You have a sort of a gradient, but at, during exercise, that gradient is going to be even steeper because you're consuming the oxygen. And so that steepness of the gradient is going to facilitate diffusion. So other things that influence diffusion, muscle fiber type. Let's think about these. Which fiber types are your aerobic ones? Type 1, right? The type 1 fibers... They specialize in aerobic metabolism. They can do the other types, but they emphasize aerobic metabolism. So they're going to be set up to have as much oxygen delivered as possible. So if you look at your type 1 fibers, here's a stain. Your type 1 fibers would be these green ones here. Type 1 fibers tend to have more capillaries around them. Uh, so let's just do diffusion is equal to the cross-sectional area for diffusion times the change in pressure over the thickness or the diffusion distance, right? So by having more capillaries around the muscle fiber, there's a greater cross-sectional area in those type 1 fibers. They have more mitochondria consuming the oxygen, so that delta P is probably a little lower. But also importantly, the thickness, the distance that the oxygen has to travel is less. Uh, if you have capillary here, 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 to get oxygen into the middle, it's going to be a short distance. The more capillaries you have, the shorter the diffusion distance. Another really important adaptation with these type 1 fibers is that they're small. So these are type 2, type 2, type 2, type 1. Uh, look, the type 1 is puny. It's small. And that's not by coincidence. Part of the reason or the benefit of them being small is that you're minimizing this thickness, this diffusion distance. So now, now you don't have to diffuse the oxygen as far, and so you can have a much ra more rapid rate of oxygen diffusion. Um, this oxygen diffusion, the ability to diffuse oxygen out of the capillary into the muscle, is something that's been overlooked in and exercise physiology research for quite a while. Um, and I think your even your textbook doesn't do a very good job of treating this. It, the textbook kind of makes it seem that when you're talking about VO2 max, they rely heavily on the FIC principle, which you used to calculate VO2, right? Where 
VO2 it can be calculated as the product of cardiac output times arterial venous oxygen difference. Um, because of this equation, a lot of people, including the, the authors in the textbook, they often ignore everything besides cardiac output. Uh, let's go to this thing. So cardiac output is only this one piece of the, the oxygen cascade or the journey of oxygen from the air, the air to the mitochondria. Um, diffusion is super important. Diffusion from the, from the lungs into the blood is very important. The function of the lungs to get oxygen in is very important. What I hope to emphasize to you is that every step in this cascade of events, whether it's the lung, the pulmonary vasculature, the heart, the skeletal muscle vasculature, the size of the muscle, the mitochondria, every one of those steps is very important in getting oxygen down to the mitochondria so you can do aerobic metabolism and is very important for your VO2 max. Now, in most healthy individuals, as we've said multiple times during the semester, the lungs are usually overbuilt. The lungs aren't often the limitation in a healthy person. Uh, they can be in certain scenarios, uh, but most of the time we're okay with the lungs. Uh, the heart often is a point of constraint where if you could just increase how much blood the heart pumps, VO2 max can go up. But you can also increase VO2 max by improving how much oxygen can diffuse out of the blood. So all these factors uh, that we've talked about, cross-sectional area, thickness, capillary density, all those, if you can improve that, you can improve diffusion and get more oxygen to the mitochondria and can have a higher VO2 max. VO2 max relies on all of these different steps to work, uh, work together. And different diseases and different uh, conditions will affect different parts of the cascade. Uh, obviously, like something like COPD or lung disease will affect the lungs. And heart disease can affect the heart most of these diseases also will affect these arteries to where they, in heart disease and in lung disease, they have really crappy arteries and can't deliver the oxygen where it needs to go. That idea of sympatholysis, taking blood away from the gut and putting it in the active muscle, it doesn't happen so well in diseased and older individuals. So these arteries, the function of these arteries can often impair exercise performance. And of course, if you don't have any mitochondria, you can't consume oxygen. So those are also important. All right, long story short, every step in the oxygen cascade is very important for your VO2 max. All right, uh, that's it. We got to the black screen again. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day and uh, keep up all the good work. Look on Learning Suite for any quizzes and assignments. Bye.